so today we have uh, visiting from Mumbai, we have uh, Richard Gan. He's a graduate student who's graduating this year. He's working with Rishi Katri. He's done uh, some a lot of work on the kinetics and the Ives of Dovich effect. And that's what he's going to talk about today. And, um, so we'll learn about the E modes and B modes that those generate for future CMD work. Um, so, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Uh, so I, I'm a grad student at TIFR, and I work mainly on the polarized kinetics and Elzeldovich effect. So normally, uh, with kinetics and Elzeldovich effect, you associate a temperature and isotropy in the cosmic microwave background. But if you go to the second order in perturbation theory, then you can also have a polarization signal from the kinetics and Elzeldovich effect. And today I'm going to talk about in details about that specific effect and how do you measure this signal uh, with the coming generation experiments. So let's start with a bit of the basics. Uh, to generate polarization in cosmic microwave background, you need to have Thomson scattering of photons from a quadrupolar anisotropy with, with electrons. So what I have drawn in this carton is that there is an electron sitting here, and it's in rest frame. You can see that the photons coming from this direction have a different intensity than photons coming from this direction. And so as you know that uh, when you scatter from, from Maxwell's equation, you know that when you scatter, you, can, you cannot send a photon in the direction of its polarization. So automatically, one of the polarization direction from these things get that uh, cancels, and, and the scattered radiation is actually linearly polarized. So this is a very simple example of how, can, how you can generate polarization in the CMB. Now the question arises that what are the sources of this quadrupole? So there can be different sources of this quadrupole. Once we know about the, the, the inflationary gravitational waves, which can generate tensor perturbation, and that generates this quadrupolar anisotropy, which leads to polarization. Uh, the second is like the free streaming of photons itself can generate, I mean, transfer power to quadrupole from lower modes. And that is how you actually get this polarization, this E modes and B modes at the time of reionization, which you call the reionization bump. And lastly, uh, which I will be talking mostly about today, is that you can also generate this quadrupole anisotropy from a peculiar velocity of electrons itself. So, so as you know that uh, from the last scattering surface onwards, the universe was basically uh, neutral. There was a uh, uh, photon was free streaming towards you, and during reionization, uh, a lot of free electrons got generated. And these free electrons post reionizations are mostly located at the at intercluster medium of galaxy clusters. So I'll, I'll mostly be concentrating. So there are other places where these free electrons are such as the circumgalactic medium, the, the filamentary structure of this universe. But today, I'm going to mainly talk about the free electrons that is present in galaxy clusters. So like these galaxy clusters, because of their mutual gravitational attraction uh, for the surrounding matter distribution, they actually have a peculiar velocity uh, on top of this Hubble flow. And due to this peculiar velocity, the electrons in the intergalactic medium also coherently moves with the same peculiar velocity. And so uh, if you go to the electron rest frame, you will see that the incoming CMB radiation is not isotropic, but it has all kinds of multiple anisotropy present in that. So this primarily happens because of two different reasons. One is the nonlinear nature of the relativistic Doppler shift when you actually shift from your frame to the, I mean, in which the CMB is isotropic to the frame of the electrons. Uh, and, 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 and the second reason is that the nonlinear relation between the temperature and the intensity in the Planck spectrum itself. So because of these two reasons, what you can actually show is that, so for example, uh, let's take this equation. This equation actually tells you the, the the temperature that the electrons will see in its rest frame, which basically means that the electrons doesn't see a black body radiation. I mean, it sees a black body radiation, but with different temperature in different direction. So it's not an isotropically black body radiation. So if you then expand it in orders of 
it's, uh, of the velocity of, of this electron, then you can see that you can write it uh, as a perturbation in your temperature field itself. And then when you expand the occupation number density uh, in, in Taylor expansion, what you can show that at second order in this V, that is this V square term, you get actually a differential black body spectrum and also what we call a wide distorted spectrum. Uh, so the, the wide distorted spectrum basically means that you upscatter electrons from lower frequency and transfer it to higher frequency, which creates a distortion in your CMB black body radiation. And since the scatter spectrum is, is, is wide distorted, this actually makes this signal a very unique signal because there are no other signet, signal in the, in, in, in the CMB which, has a both, which is both polarized and has a wide distorted spectrum. So basically, this makes it a very clean signal to obtain, uh, to actually uh, 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 this makes it a very clean signal to actually observe in the future. So now let's dive a, a bit more in, in details about this polarization signal itself. So the polarization signal depends on the optical depth of the galaxy clusters. And this polarization, and it also depends on the transverse peculiar velocity field. And so, what I have plotted in this in this diagram is that, for example, this is this blue blob is is the galaxy cluster, and it has some peculiar velocity. And this this plane is actually the imagine as to be the plane of the sky, and this V T is actually showing the transverse velocity. So, what you can actually show is that the polarized direction coming uh, this radi the polarization direction of this radiation is actually will be perpendicular to the direction of the transverse velocity of the galaxy cluster. And generally, you actually characterize this polarization uh, by what you call as the Stokes parameters, the U and Q Stokes parameters. And here we have used a linear combination of, of, of these Stokes parameters to characterize the polarization. Uh, you choose this combination because it's just mathematically convenient to, to do so because of the rotation properties of spin two fields when you rotate your coordinate system. Uh, so the basic, uh, the most important part to notice here are these factors. So if you calculate some numbers, what you get is that this optical depth is of the order of 10 to the power minus three, and the velocity, the peculiar velocity field of these galaxy clusters are of the order of 10 to the power minus 6 in the units of C. So what you're looking at, you are looking at a sub-nano-Kelvin polarization signal. So it's, it's, it's of the order of angstrom, actually. And the sensitivity of current generation experiments is of the order of micro-Kelvin. So the, naturally, the question comes that how do you observe such a weak effect uh, with the coming generation experiments? So one thing is clear that you cannot observe this uh, directly. You cannot just point your instrument towards a galaxy cluster and, and see this polarization signal. It, it, it always be noise dominated. So what you can do is that you can obtain the information present in this polarization signal in a statistical way. And what we have developed is that we have, we have formulate a, a theoretical framework or estimator uh, which can enable us to detect uh, this polarization signal statistically in, in, with the coming generation experiments. So I'll, next I'll talk about uh, this pairwise estimator in details. So if you're familiar with the pairwise KZ in that what you do is that you have galaxy cluster pairs which are separated in space by some distance. And since the normal KZ, the temp which creates a temperature and isotropy, that depends on the radial velocity direction. So what happens if two clusters are coming towards each other, the radial velocity direction from your frame will be like one going away and one coming towards you, which creates a, a KZ signal of opposite sign. So what you have to do is that you have to subtract the KZ signal from these two clusters, which then, which then will be added up coherently. And you can stack clusters which are separated by a given distance. And if you stack enough number of pairs, then eventually your signal to noise ratio will go above one and you will be able to detect it. So we applied a similar technique here, but since this is a spin two field, this polarization field is a spin two field, it doesn't change when you, change, when you flip the direction of your velocity. 
So unlike, unlike kz, if your radial velocity direction changes, you get a positive or a negative kz. In this case, if you flip your transverse velocity to the opposite direction, the polarization signal remains the same. So you cannot actually subtract the two signal, you have to add it in this case. So what we did is that we added the polarization signal coming from this, class, this cluster and this cluster to, together and then we stacked uh, as, a, as a function of their intercluster inter separation distance in the three-dimensional space. So when you do that, uh, what you can show is that you, you generate a net non-zero polarization signal. So to understand why this is the case, uh, let's look at this figure. So for imagine that this cluster is getting attracted towards some other gravitational potential out here that is caused by galaxies or galaxy cluster, whatever it is present here. And there are other surrounding structure which perturbs its uh, velocity field slightly. And in this ch choice of coordinate system, uh, for example, uh, this velocity is not exactly aligned to x-axis, but due to this small perturbation, it is slightly above the x-axis. So as I said that the polarization direction will always be perpendicular to the transverse velocity field. And from this two diagram, you can see that both the Q and the U-Stokes parameters, they are actually negative in this case. But it might happen even if, they are meet, if, the, if it is at getting attracted to the gravitational potential which is sitting uh, on the x-axis, it may happen that due to perturbation, the velocity field is slightly below the x-axis. So the transverse velocity direction in this situation is slightly below the x-axis. So in this case, you can see that the Stokes parameter Q is actually negative, but the U Stokes parameter become positive. So what happens is that in this choice of coordinate system, if you add uh, galaxy, if you add cluster pairs, uh, your U parameters will sometimes be positive and sometimes be negative, and it will average out to zero but the Q-stokes parameters will always be negative, and so it will add up coherently, and which will give you a net polarization signal. So I should mention that this is for this particular choice of coordinate system. In some, if you rotate your coordinate system, your both U and Q-stokes parameters will be non-zero non because the Q and U will rotate among each other, but your net polarization signal remains the same. One more important thing to notice about this choice of coordinate system is that you expect your U polarization to be zero. So that gives you a sense of your null level of your instrument, like you have a handle on your systematics of your instrument because you have an estimate of something being zero. And when will you try to measure it because of the systematics, it will not, not be zero, obviously. So that will give you a handle on your noise level. Uh, so the next part of the talk is basically how to formulate this whole story mathematically. So what you have is an estimator in which you add the polarization from one cluster and the polarization from the second cluster. You align the intercluster separation along your x-axis of your chosen coordinate system. You weight it by some factors, which I will talk about in details later, and then you sum over all such pairs. So when you do that, you can actually formulate this pairwise estimator and then what we have done is that we have uh, estimated the, on, the ensemble average of, of this estimator and given a theoretical expression so of what you, can, what you will estimate with this thing. So what you can do is that you can actually do an ensemble average of your estimator that uh, similar to what you do with your uh, uh, CMB estimator, for example, when you measure CMB, you actually create an estimator which tells you, you find the, uh, the harmonic modes, you add them up, and you sum over all the M values. And then what you theoretically do is that you find the ensemble average over that estimator and, and try to see if that is a biased estimator or an unbiased estimator. So that, that is like an equivalent what we are doing here. We are trying to find the ensemble average over this uh, polarization signal. And what you can show is that this ensemble average is actually uh, on, uh, is an ensemble average over the velocity of the galaxy clusters. So initially, we took these galaxy clusters to be as particles moving. So this ensemble average automatically is an ensemble average over the two-point phase space distribution of these galaxy clusters, which you can then relate to the underlying velocity and density field of, 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 these, uh, dart, of, these, gal of these halo fields. So since these velocities are unbiased tracers, we haven't 
uh, there is no bias factors, but these, these halo fields, you can actually relate it to the underlying dark matter distribution. And what you can finally say that you have to calculate this sort of bias spectrum, uh, which are associated with the bias factors of, of, of your underlying halo distribution. So uh, one more thing to notice is that you have to actually go to the second order in perturbation theory to calculate these bias spectrum things. And so after doing all these things, you end up with a looking uh, expression which is uh, a bit complicated looking, but uh, you don't have to uh, focus on everything here. All these things are geometric factors which either gets summed over or gets integrated out. The important point to notice is that, that this, this is dependent on the cosmological parameters. It depends on the optical depth of the galaxy cluster as I mentioned. It also depends on the linear matter power spectrum and it also depends on astrophysical parameters like the cluster bias factors. So uh, let's look at this plot. This plot is actually a, a plot of, of, of this thing for a single pair of, of, of cluster. So what, what you can see here that I've plotted the, on the y-axis is the pairwise PKZ signal and on the x-axis is the intercluster separation distance in three-dimensional space. So what you can see is that uh, the more massive the cluster pair is, the more the higher is the signal. This is simply because the more massive the cluster, their velocity fields are, are higher, their optical depth is also more, so you get a more uh, polarization signal out of it. And also you should notice that what we have naively estimated that this is to be a sub nano Kelvin signal, we actually get back that from this, uh, from this calculation that is actually of the order of angstrom. And it also decreases with increase in the intercluster separation. This is because uh, simply the, the correlation between the velocity field decreases as you increase the distance. So, yes? Uh, so, uh, it's small so I think what we are seeing here is is the features of the BO. So it's like 150 megaparsec. No, the left edge. Uh, so here I think so. What is happening is there are like less number of pairs available in these short distances. So I guess the statistics is playing a bit a bit of a role here because you increase your number of pairs as you go to larger distances and. And I, I think there is just uh, that factor coming into play. And also maybe there are like, so there are also some numerical artifacts like your power spectrum doesn't like converge pretty well, the correlation function, if you estimate it numerically because of all other factors, it, it, it kind of tilts down a bit. So all these factors, yes. Huh, so what? So you don't have to assume the velocity because you are actually doing an ensemble average over the velocity field. So what you give here are the mass of the clusters and all all, all these things. So you're, it, you average over the velocity field. So you can look at this expression. What you need is like the matter power spectrum. What you need is is the cluster bias factors, and what you give is the optical depth, which is which you can calculate given a certain mass and certain certain uh, size of the cluster. And so what we have to assume here is that we have to assume that the, the electron distribution inside galaxy clusters and what we took to be like, we assume that it is like the cosmic uh, ratio is maintained, like the cosmic ratio between baryon and dark matter that is still maintained in here. That is all we have to assume. Right, and the rest of the things are just geometric factors. Uh, right. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, how do you weight your est estimator properly to get an optimal estimator. So in what happens is in the normal KZ is that when you, you, when you take the normal pairwise KZ, you need to weight the pairs which are more aligned towards your line of sight because it is dependent on the radial velocity. So what the calculation tells you that the pairs which are more aligned towards your line of sight, they give you a better signal. But in this case, what you can show is that the pairs which are more transverse to your line of sight on the plane of the sky, that gives you a better signal. 
So you have to weight those pairs more than the other pairs. And also you can do a mass weighting or an optical depth weighting, which is like an equivalent thing to say, it's just that the more massive the pair, the more is the signal, and you want to weight those pair more than the others. So if you do this kind of weighting, you actually end up with a, a more optimal estimator, which you can see from here. So for this orange curve, we just did a naive averaging over all the pairs without, uh, but if you do this weighting, weighted average over all the pairs, you end up with a better signal to noise ratio. And so this is like, we have shown that for all the clusters which are above a mass of 10 to the power 14. So, right. So in the next curve, what it shows is that, uh, for example, if, if, if in a perfect world, you can actually observe all the clusters above a certain mass threshold, what is the e e equivalent signal to noise ratio that you achieve? So I said a bit earlier that more massive the pair, the higher is the signal. But you can see that here this signal to noise ratio is least in this case. Uh, what, what is happening here is that no matter how massive your uh, one single pair is, the signal is so weak that you cannot get directly from one pair. So you have to stack many, many pairs of, 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 of that of, of, of those masses. But what, what happens is that if, if your cluster becomes more massive, it automatically means that they are lesser in numbers. So you have lesser number of pairs to actually stack with. So that, that actually, so you don't get enough number of pairs to stack and, and you lose on your signal to noise ratio. And so from this red curve, you can see that if we can detect all the clusters above 10 to the power 13.5 solar mass, and we can actually detect this pairwise signal to noise, uh, pairwise sig signal at a significance of just above one uh, within this intercluster separation distance. But obviously, we cannot, at least in the near future, detect all the clusters above 10 to the 13.5 solar mass. Or, so what we did is that we did a more realistic survey that uh, we took the clusters from a SZ survey such as CMBS4 or CMBHD, and then we said that, okay, what I have plotted here is that on the y-axis is the number of cluster pairs that you require, at least you require to detect this signal at a signal to noise ratio of one for certain given sensitivity and angular resolution of this CMBHD and CMBS4 experiment. And on this blue and CN curve, what we have shown is that what is the expected number of such pairs that you will get from this survey? So obviously you can see that the expected number of pairs that, that you will get from this survey falls short of what, the, what is the required number to reach the signal to a noise ratio of one. Uh, but fortunately, we can do something better here. What we did next is that we realized that you don't need to pair a, a cluster with another cluster. You can actually pair a cluster with surrounding galaxies. And what, what, what is the advantage in that? Is that the galaxies are actually more numerous in number. So they are, a, they are a better tracer of your underlying gravitational potential. And so when you pair many such galaxy clusters, uh, you actually get, end up getting a better signal to noise ratio. So a better way to understand that is that if you, if in a perfect world you can actually reconstruct your underlying velocity field, you actually do not need to do this pairwise business. You can actually stack individual cluster just by aligning their velocity direction perfectly, and that will give you a, a eventually give you a signal to noise ratio above one. But assuming that you cannot reconstruct your velocity field perfectly, at least at this time. And this pairwise thing actually is a proxy for un your underlying velocity field. So in a pair, one, one of these galaxies or cluster is telling you where the other cluster is actually moving. So this is, you can understand by this diagram that say, for example, this cluster is surrounded by more galaxies on this side and less galaxies on this side. So statistically speaking, it will actually be moving towards this gravitational potential. So when you stack such, uh, galaxy cluster pairs, there are two, uh, what shall I say, two competing effects which comes into play. One is that in a pair, if one of these things are galaxies and the other thing is cluster, you, you do not get any polarization signal from the galaxy. Uh, this is primarily because the optical depth of these galaxies is like two orders of magnitude below the optical depth of clusters. 
So basically you do not get any polarization signal. So what happens is that you lose out on the polarization signal here, but on the other hand there are many many more cluster galaxy pairs than you have cluster cluster pairs. So you can actually stack many of these objects much more than what you get from cluster cluster pairs. So when you do that you eventually see that uh, you, you can end up with a signal uh, with enough number of clus cluster galaxy pairs which you need uh, to observe this effect at a signal to noise ratio above 1. So what we have plotted here we have just repeated the same exercise but instead of cluster cluster we have taken the cluster the polarization signal at the cluster position from the CMB HD and CMB S4 wide survey and then we have taken the galaxies from a survey like LSST uh, assuming that we get a spectroscopic data in the in the future and, and that is like a big assumption but if we do get that you can actually uh, observe this pair this cross pair wise pair uh, PKZ signal at a at a signal to noise ratio which is far above 1. So I should mention that this is still uh, there are some caveats to this. One thing is that you have to actually first observe this signal using multiple frequency channels and however perfect your component separation analysis is there will be still some residual uh, variance from primary signatures and that will decrease your signal to noise ratio a bit and also if you do not get your spectroscopic data of, 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 of the position of your galaxies, if you have just uh, photometric data that, that still will work but it will decrease your signal to noise ratio. Uh, but keeping this aside in a perfect world we can show that uh, you, you from CMB HD and LSST you can end up getting a signal to noise ratio which is uh, around 6 and with CMBS4 and LSST you can actually get a signal to noise ratio which is uh, slightly bigger than 2. So fine if we even eventually detect this signal what, what we can do with this, what, what is the use of these things. So one thing is that the it, this as I showed that this polarization signal is, is sensitive to the transverse velocity field. So if you can detect it at a high significance you can use this to reconstruct your underlying transverse velocity field or at least you can do a forward modeling and then match uh, with the expected polarization signal from this case which will eventually help you reconstructing your underlying velocity field. And there are other applications to this is that probably you can probe uh, rotations of galaxy clusters, there are ideas which tells you that there if, if galaxy clusters rotate uh, there is a polarization signal associated with that. Uh, and also you can probably probe the shear velocity field because you expect that if the, if the galaxies, if the clusters are like collapsing spherically then the ratio of the transverse velocity field to the radial velocity field will have a definite ratio but if they are like, if it is ellipsoidal collapse then there is a different ratio of the transverse velocity field to the radial velocity field and this, so probably from the ratio of, of the pairwise KZ to the pairwise PKZ you can actually get a handle on, on your uh, sh cos cosmic shear field around it. This is basically same as if you take the moving lens effect and use the KZ to do the same thing. And also lastly if you can detect it at a high enough significance you can, it is, as I said that this is sensitive to the cosmological parameters so you can actually use it to put constraint on your cosmological parameters. Uh, so. Uh, so what's the time do I like? So, I, so let's let's end end it by just saying that okay. So what I have said right now is that it's all, all the things that I have said is is a part of the standard cosmological model. Is nothing beyond cosmological beyond standard model that you need to do to get this kind of polarization signal. It is everything is out there. It's it's a very clean signal to detect. But the problem is that it's a, it's a very weak signal and we are trying to figure out different ways to actually detect this signal. So this cross pairwise technique is actually uh, a feasible method in the near, I mean in the in next decades to actually detect this signal and as I said that this is free from the dominance of any other primary CMB signal uh, because of its unique spectral distortion and polarization properties. So yeah, thank you, I'll happy to take some questions.
Okay, does this work? Okay, it sounds like it does. Uh, thanks for the talk. This is interesting. <clears throat> You were talking at the end about some applications. I'm wondering if there's anything interesting to learn about maybe the redshift evolution of the polarization signal. Um, yes. Yeah. The the crazy idea being like birefringence, but <laughs> that's... <laughs> yeah. So right now, the problem is that you cannot do a tomographic analysis because we are falling short of cluster pairs. So here, we have to like stack up all the pairs available at all redshift. Mm-hmm to get this signal, just to data detection of the signal. Mm -hmm. But in future, if you if the sensitivity of your CMB of your CMB experiments increases, mm -hmm. right, so then you you will have enough number of pairs at a shorter redshift range to get this signal. So then you can actually do a tomographic analysis. Yeah. And then probably yeah you can probe all these effects. Okay. But right now we are just falling short of pairs. Yeah that makes sense. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so aren't you? Uh, I mean, isn't the signal uh, degenerated between astrophysics and cosmology just like far as KZ? Yeah. I mean, if you want to put cosmological constraints, you will all obviously have like degeneracies between. Right. But can can you actually combine uh, this and moving lens to constrain astrophysics? Yeah. I mean, this is like. So the point is that you have to detect it at that significance. So if you have a very high significance detection of something and a very low significance detection of some other thing. Right. I don't know how much of an effect this will be on your, I mean, but it, it adds up complementary information. So if you have a good enough detection, obviously it will add up to your constraints in your cosmological parameters. Right, yeah, and then on that point, uh, I mean, do you really need to do pairwise? So why can't you just cross correlate your, you know, the Y polarized Y map with just a galaxy survey? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, what, what you can do is that, sure, you can cross-correlate and that will increase signal. So before this work, we did another work where we actually estimated the E and B mode power spectrum. So for example, I can probably show, yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what you're looking at is the E and B mode power spectrum of the wide distorted component right. from the era of reionization. Right. right. But so this, this is, is auto just the auto power spectrum. Right. You can repeat the same thing with a cross power spectrum, like you can cross it with this with some galaxy survey right. and the cross correlation will probably make bring it above the sensitivity level. Yes, you can surely do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, have, have you thought about what other non-standard? So it's there in the standard model, so we should go and find it. But have you thought about all the weird physics that this might be sensitive to? Yeah. So, I mean. In the standard model, as I said, that there are these cosmic shear field and all that you can probe. I mean, this is what I have like discussed with people a bit. But it is sensitive as as I mean, it's probably in your paper it's shown that it's sensitive to the the cosmic bifringence from the axion field. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that is that there, and anything that disturbs your matter power spectrum will have an effect on this because it is dependent on, on your velocity uh, velocity two-point correlation function, which is like related to the matter density field in some way. So any, any kind of new physics that disturbs your large-scale structure formation uh, will have an imprint on this. Anything that disturbs your sigma-8 will have an imprint on this. So, so what, what is the signal? Is this, uh, so is this a monopole or at the, at the location of cluster? What, what do you actually see? In what the you have to actually measure is the, the polarization at the location of cluster. Right, so... And then you have to find out galaxy survey. From a galaxy survey, you have to find out the position of galaxies and right. all. In, and I mean, there should be an overlap between these things. Right. And that will, if you know the photo, I mean, if you know the redshift of these things, yeah. then you can find out the orientation and all, all these things clearly. And then you just stack up. And I'm just wondering, for, for example, like for a, for a KSE, it's just a monopole at the, at the location of cluster, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's the same. It's the same? Thing. Okay, it's yeah. Be, I mean, for moving lenses, a dipole along the direction yeah, yeah, of the yeah. velocity. Yeah, no, so it's, it's just a monopole, yes. Okay, yeah, all right, thanks. All right, well, um, yeah, thank you. let's thank the speaker again for